pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This evening, two sets of minutes, one from regular meeting number 16, which was the March 11th council meeting. The second is for the special meeting number 17, held on Saturday, March 27, before our budget workshop. Like Madam a motion? Chairman? Yes, sir. I request approval for both. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. We now have a time where citizens may come and address the council on items that are not on the regular agenda for this evening. Is there anybody in the audience who would care to do that? Yes, sir. Please come to the podium and give us your name and address. Um, yes, my name is Larry Skillings, and I live at 427 Mitchell Road, Cape Elizabeth. And the reason why I'm here this evening is um, I'd like to bring to the attention of the council members, um, they have a town ordinance that uh, applies to junked vehicles. Mm -hmm. And according to the ordinance, you're, you're allowed one unregistered vehicle. Well, I have a little bit of a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, at my residence, uh, my next door neighbor has uh, junked a vehicle uh, right directly in front of my bow window, which is approximately about 40 feet. And that's our focal point. But the, what he has done with this, um, he's using it as a utility shed. And uh, it's, you know, it's quite disturbing because uh, every weekend you see him go out and take different items out of it. And it is, he has shovels, picks, seed spreader, uh, weed whacker, gasoline cans, rims, saw husses, insulation, two by fours, and this has been going on for a period of about eight months. And I, it, what it does, it, it kind of leaves the door open. Uh, when they say you're allowed one unregistered vehicle, this is, is going to cause problems because, as I said, he's using it as a utility ship. <coughs> and theoretically, um, if I wanted to, I could probably bring in a, a school bus and set it on the, you know, on the property line and use that as a to store my, uh, I'm a self-employed builder. I could use it as, um, you know, put my pipe staging in planks and so forth. But it <clears throat> it's really caused a problem. And why I am bringing this to your attention is uh, later down the line, uh, this could happen other places in Cape Elizabeth. So, uh, you know, I just was wondering what your feeling is about, you know, possibly changing the ordinance. Have you spoken to anybody at Town Hall about this? Yes, I've, uh, uh, Mike McGovern's come down and seen it. Okay. And uh, Bill Jordan's been down there to see it. And they've all agreed that it's being done deliberately where he is located, mm -hmm. which is directly right in front of my window. Okay. Uh, it's, it hasn't got anything to do with, uh, what it is, it's over a, a land dispute. And he's doing this, uh, I think, out of spite. He has placed it right directly in front of my window. And, and as I said, you know, uh, this could really get out of control in certain sections of Cape if people really wanted to do it. I mean, as I said, there's so many uh, holes in that ordinance. Uh, you know, like I said, he's using his utility shed. And uh, I can't believe something like that is being done in Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Every weekend he goes out and... Skillings, did you talk to the code enforcement officer, Ernie McBain? Yes, Ernie McBain has been down too, and he has agreed with me too uh, that it is being done deliberate. And he said, according to the ordinance, he said his hands are tied, and he said uh, it's a shame that it, that this is happening. And he says I can see that it's being used as a utility shed. I mean, you can see all the junk. You can't even get in the vehicle. It's got a hatchback. He lifts out, falls all his tools out, and we works on weekends and so forth. When he gets done at the end of the day, he throws everything all back in it. The other day I saw him come home with, uh, he had been to the lumber company and picked up rolls of insulation and two by fours, backs right up to his car, lifts the hash back up and throws everything in there, just leaves it in there, stores it in there. And it, I mean, every time I pull my drapes back in the living room, that's a focal point right there. We're looking at a junk vehicle. And at the end of this month, we'll be there for eight months. 
And all through the holidays, through Thanksgiving and so forth, he was kind enough to jack it up and set it on a <coughs> block to take the back wheels off of it. People that stop in to visit, they can't believe it. They said, oh my God, I can't believe that there's a junk vehicle parked right there in front of your window. So uh, I just wanted to address you with uh, that problem and I, I was hoping that you know, maybe in the future someone could uh, maybe uh, change this ordinance and, and uh, down the road a ways that uh, other people won't have the problem that I've been living with eight months. We do have a committee of the council which is called the Ordinance Committee and it might be appropriate. We'll see how Councilor Cogsville, Cogsville feels, who's chairman of that committee, for them to review that ordinance with the code enforcement officer perhaps and see if there's any tightening up on it that's appropriate. Councilor Dahlbeck? Uh, educational question, uh, probably not of Larry as uh, much as it might be of Mike, but what is the hole in the ordinance that allows this? I, I'm not too sure I would define it as a hole in the ordinance. Uh, there is a, a provision in the ordinance that allows, as, as Mr. Skellens has explained, uh, anyone to keep an unregistered vehicle on their property. We probably have several hundred throughout the community uh, with, with folks that go away for the year, uh, go away for the winter and currently register their vehicle. Uh, we also do not at all regulate what people store within their vehicles. Do, uh, uh, are there definitions of what a vehicle is? For example, does it mean four wheels? Or, and, and I don't know whether this has wheels on it or whether they've been removed or anything else, but... Well, this vehicle, uh, as I said, has been sitting there almost eight months. It has a jack underneath the front of it to, uh, on the passenger side, which has a flat tire. Then he has one of those real small spare tires on the passenger side. And, uh, uh, and that's the way it's been sitting, as I said, for about eight months, except for a period of a month and a half we're setting up on cement blocks. And I do have a concern about gasoline leakage, and so I do have children that live right, you know, of course we're only about 40 feet away from the vehicle. And uh, as I said, coming back to the ordinance, uh, what would stop a person, uh, say, to haul a junk vehicle in and convert it into a clubhouse for their children? I mean, there's nothing that, that says that they can't do that. Hey, so, as, you, as you can see, the council is not up to speed with the specifics mm -hmm. of this ordinance. I don't think we can come to any conclusions on this this evening. And I know you did leave a message at my house one evening, and when I mm -hmm. Did try to return the call. I will say your line was busy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> did not get back to doing that. Um, let us look into this, and we will be back in touch with you about it. Okay. I would appreciate we appreciate that. you bringing it to our attention tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. To answer answer Councillor Dalbeck's question, uh, the the only provision the ordinance has is that it uh, is an unregistered vehicle. We don't get into definitions within the ordinance as to the condition an unregistered vehicle needs to be. Is there anything out of curiosity that says uh, where on the property, any distance from uh, boundary lines, et cetera? Nothing. So it is wide open. Okay, thank you. Please don't feel that you are the only one who needs to be brought up to speed on this ordinance. <laughs> I think we're, uh, sir, he has please come to the microphone. Um, as I said, there's been several people down to look at this vehicle and as they can see in his yard out there he had other places where he could have tucked that back mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying yes but he deliberately set it right directly in that certain spot so it's okay. being done deliberately thank you council Kramer. yeah madam chair it might be interesting if uh, the ordinance committee takes up at least looking at this if we might be able to get a copy of our our neighboring municipality uh, ordinances both south portland and, and scarborough just to see how they've addressed the issue uh, for comparison purposes the manager's noting that thank you <coughs> anybody else in the audience who would like to address the council <coughs> excuse me on an issue not on the agenda this evening Seeing none, we will move along to reports and correspondence at the Council. Madam Chairman. Councilor Chapel. The Regional Waste Services had their meeting on March the 18th. Of, we took up the uh, board membership that I told you about a month ago when we had our meeting. And there's now 28 members on the board. We still have our one member. We took up the capital projects, which is going to be very interesting, Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday of this week. They're having an open house of the newly opened education and training facility. Uh, so far, tomorrow night, we have myself and Councillor 
Chicago Chanel and Council of Jordan going over at 6 o'clock. Anybody else that would like to go, why, let me know and I'll arrange a tour for you. I think it'll be a very interesting tour of the facilities. The Town Center Planning Committee has a very important night coming up Wednesday. We're having a public forum here at the Council Chambers at 7.30. We're going to be showing the maps that we have gotten together that have been prepared for different ideas for the town center of how the roads will be and how the plantings will be and how the islands will be and all kinds of interesting things for you to see. So I would cordially invite all of the people that are here and all of the people that are listening tonight to join with us on Wednesday evening at 7.30 right here and give us their opinions and their input on this plan that we've been working on for a year and a half before we submit it to the council in May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Mr. McGovern? Yeah, I just wanted to mention to the town council, last Thursday night, I attended a meeting of the Cumberland County Firefighters Association. I believe that's the proper name of the group. And uh, the, the, I don't usually attend meetings of, of that particular association. <laughs> However, I did attend that, attend that evening because they presented the uh, Cumberland County Firefighter Service Award uh, for the year to John Sibley, uh, who is a longtime volunteer here, here in Engine 2, and uh, certainly a well-deserved uh, award, and uh, I, was, I was happy to be there to see John receive it. That's nice. Anybody else? Representing the council in the town one evening last month, I attended a reception for the string quartet from the Portland area sister city of Archangel, and just wanted to share that with you. One of the most impressive things that's happened to me since I've been on council was when we had Archangel visitors here. I think it was our first year on council. It was very early on. And how moving that was for me. I found this also moving in that one of the gentlemen on the string quartet was addressing the group and they did have a podium and they had flags and he said it was the first time he had stood between the flag of his country and the flag of our country. And that was just one of those nice goosebump feelings. It was really special. I really enjoyed being able to represent Cape Elizabeth. Um, on May 6th, which is the first Thursday in May, I want to make sure that this council knows that they are welcome to attend the monthly meeting of the county mayors and chairman of council association. There will be a presentation on the restructuring of county government that will be held at, in the state of Maine room at Portland City Hall starting at 5 o'clock that evening. If anybody wishes to avail themselves of that opportunity to become more familiar with that proposal, it's a great opportunity to do it and also meet some of the elected officials in neighboring communities. I did attend the March 17th meeting of the Greater Portland Council of Governments Executive Committee. There was a presentation by a human services panel with representatives from the Southern Maine Area Agency on Aging, from the United Way, and from Prop Children's Services. Very informative um, meeting. They did have some handouts and literature about some of the services that they provide for Cape Elizabeth residents as well. I also want this council to be aware that COG is reinstituting its Regional Citizen of the Year Award and the Innovation Awards. I'm not sure if they'll still be called Innovation Awards. We're grappling with that right now. So I hope you all will be thinking of appropriate um, recipients for the Regional Citizen of the Year and for any Innovation Awards that Cape Elizabeth might be able to apply for. It'll be a little dicey if I'm on. I won't be on the selection committee, <laughs> we'll see that. But we're glad we've been able to reinstitute those. Another um, instance where I've been representing the town is on the Greater Portland Economic Development Council. I will assume you saw a week ago yesterday in the Sunday newspaper an article about the enterprise um, operation that that group hopes to be initiating and I'm fortunate enough to serve on a steering committee that is looking at that. And if any of you do have questions or comments about that, I'd appreciate receiving them. 
And I thank Councilor Chapel. I did have in my notes too about the town center forum on Wednesday. I think people really need to know they are welcome to participate in that and hopefully after having their interest peaked through the Cape Courier article, we'll have a good turnout that evening. All right, we do have this evening two public hearings scheduled. First one is on the sign ordinance. Councilor Cogswell, as Chairman of the Ordinance Committee, would you introduce that, please? Yes, would you like me to read all the changes as I did last time? Um, whatever is your pleasure. I've heard a negative <laughs> comment. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to bring to the attention of the Council that we have had legal opinion on, this, on the draft. Um, the draft that was in your packet, however, um, changed the intent of the ordinance and we've gone back to the original wording on signs for home occupation farm and fish stands and all non-residential uses in residential zone signs. Basically um, we're regulating the size and the height of political signs now. We have added definitions for internal uh, illumination and sign height um, we are allowing decorative pennants, which you often see in residential areas that were not legal before. <coughs> the um, code enforcement officer is now the um, authorizing body or person in the town instead of having applicants appear before the planning board and have to pay a special fee. Those are the primary changes. Um, there's also the table that was on your February copy has some changes as to the size of message boards and banners. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I would now open the public hearing on the revision, proposed revisions to the sign ordinance. Is there anybody who would like to address the council on this? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. I would like a motion, please, Councilor Cogson. Madam Chairman, I move that we approve the changes in the sign ordinance as presented. Second that. Thank you. Comments and discussion, Councilor Jordan. I I have one comment, and uh, it's not really a minority report, but it troubles me, and I think I brought it up once or twice. Or so, and then I'm not intended as an advertising sign as defined in this ordinance, which is no larger than 15 square feet with a maximum dimension of no more than five square feet. I can't see how you can hang out a banner of some sort and not be advertising something, whether it's open, closed, or what have you. You're, to me, you're advertising something. Unless it's a plain deal or even a picture on it, you'd be advertising something. And I was troubled with that going through <coughs> the The banners that we're specifically addressing are the ones that you've seen hanging outside of people's homes that show Santa Claus or have a rainbow or something on them. They're not <coughs> the ones that are used by businesses because those would be considered advertising. I, I understand that. Their square footage. I understand that, but it's what I said at the beginning. Uh, regardless what you hang out there, if there's a picture of Santa Claus on it, you're advertising Christmas or some sort, aren't you? And I just think it's an issue for the guy that's going to have to enforce the ordinance of whether it is not promoting something. That's my point. I just thought I'd throw it out, and I won't be too disturbed, regardless which way it goes. But I think it's going to be a nightmare in the future for somebody to interpret and enforce. I did discuss this with Mr. McVeigh, and it was he who brought it to our attention that these were being um, displayed in residential areas in private homes and that technically they were not allowed. I, I think from his professional experience that he would be able to make a, a fair determination as to whether or not these are advertising or purely decorative. Mr. McGovern? I just want to say, Council Jordan, I think it's important you raise this issue because the very discussion of it uh, provides a legislative history that will enable uh, the code enforcement officer to uh, determine what was intended by the town council uh, 
uh, if this should be enacted. He understands my point, I think. Mm -hmm. And this discussion will make sure, because it's all taped, uh, that everyone understands it. Just save the tape. We shall. <laughs> we do not edit ours. <laughs> Any further comment? Councilor Creelman. Yes, I, I thought I'd just make the comment. Uh, I think <clears throat> that uh, the original intent of uh, Section 21-2-1, uh, subparagraph C, the original intention of that paragraph was to uh, eliminate, you know, the billboards, so to speak, that mm -hmm. cropped up during, you know, some of the gubernatorial uh, campaigns over the last few years, literally, you know, four by eight footers that were mounted on scaffolding uh, that, you know, was really not only an eyesore, but was a public safety hazard around corners mm -hmm. and things like that. <clears throat> when I was on the Ordinance Committee, we had talked about that. Um, as one of the major motivations for, you know, trying to limit the size of political signs. Um, in point of fact, our current uh, representative to uh, the House of Representatives, uh, some of his signs that were used in 1992, as well as his opponent, um, neither of those uh, individual signs would be eligible to be used again in 1994, should our current representative run again, should his opponent who ran last time decide to run again. And I just wanted to, to bring that up in that um, this is a considerable expense, um, you know, to each of these people. Um, these are obviously professional uh, signs that, uh, that had been done very nicely, and neither of them, in my opinion, very opinionated here, but I mean, neither of them sort of met the the level of eyesore in terms of scaffolding and that type of thing. So I bring it up only because it would be nice to uh, perhaps at least think about uh, grandfathering in each of these individuals. It's complicated, I know, when you grandfather anyone in. Um, but I think the intent of the ordinance was to eliminate, as I say, the, the massive structures, not the smaller ones that I think were more tastefully, you know, um, erected along the side of the road. So I just I make that comment. Uh, I had spoken to Councillor Cogsall, <coughs> and clearly the, if you, the language uh, as it reads would be a maximum of eight square feet per sign. So that would not really be eight square feet on each side. It would be a total if you wanted to use the front and the back, it would be a total of eight square feet, basically. Um, so it's not a huge area, and I'm, I'm just wondering if we're being a little bit parsimonious in that particular section of the ordinance. Councilor Dahlbeck? I'd just like to say, I, uh, no matter what I thought of the science, grandfathering certain people in uh, so that they could do something uh, which would exclude the others would not make for a fair election. Thank you. Councillor Coxell? Yes. Um, <clears throat> in my discussion also with Councillor Creelman, I explained to him that we have spent over two meetings just debating sizes of signs. And I do have with me tonight photographs that I took at the time and measurements that I took of the signs that were out there. Um, the intent was, was more than just to eliminate those huge billboard signs. It was to um, have signs that, that do their job. I mean, they, they <coughs> tell you who's running and what, for what offers. And oftentimes, the small 20 inch by 18 have been sufficient. We um, realized that people would perhaps want more permanent signs. So after a lot of discussion, we came to the two by four measurement because you would be able to get four signs out of an eight foot sheet of plywood without having to do any fancy cutting. And after um, duplicating the size and playing with different sizes, we thought that served its purpose without becoming an eyesore, particularly if you have a large number of candidates who are running. Council Council, have, we, have you heard directly yes, from any of the candidates who had signs out last fall? No, I haven't. Okay. I've been in touch with one of the candidates' representatives, and the signs that that candidate had would not be allowed under this 
and said certainly understood if this was the town's desire would be more than happy to go along with it and agreed that there is that propensity for signs to be out of control. I agree, Councilor Dahlbeck, with your comments on the grandfathering proposal that I would be extremely uncomfortable with grandfathering for just certain people. I think if we wanted to grandfather, we'd grandfather for all signs that have been used previously and that would not solve the problem that we're trying to address. <coughs> Any further comments? Councilor Jordan. Well, I believe Councilor Kramer brought up a good point, but I wouldn't be in favor of grandfathering because I think the way the politics go today, we would get a bigger sign on the other and we would have quite a session going on. And, and uh, we went over this, as Council Cogshaw said, quite a lot. And we went out and raised it sign, raised it height. Everybody brought their own. So we made sure we were always talking about and thought this was a fair size for these political signs. And I know the highways and what have you, but candidates sign get filled up pretty well. And I think some of those larger ones, in my opinion, told me that there's, they'd overdone it. Any further discussion? Councilor Dahlbeck. All right. When would this become effective if we pass it? 30 days? 30 days from tonight. It would not be in effect during the political season for our town council okay. um, and school board Thank elections you. that are coming up. <laughs> was that Didn't want to get a midstream. <laughs> was that your concern? That's a very valid concern Good no, for people to be aware of. <laughs> All right, we do have a motion on the floor. There's no further discussion. All those in favor? All those opposed? Zero. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Ordinance Committee for their work on this. Some on hands-on meetings, it sounds like. Our second public hearing this evening is on the floodplain ordinance. And again, I'll ask Councilor Cogsell to introduce this. Yes, um, the changes in the floodplain ordinance that were proposed last month and that we're having the public hearing on this this evening are so that we stay compliant with a national flood insurance program. Um, we have some definitional changes that they wanted to add and we also did some basic um, housekeeping in that references in the old ordinance um, cited the state's article number where in our own ordinances they are chapter six. So there are just some basic changes in that. Okay. I will now open the public hearing. Is there anybody who would like to address the proposed revisions to our floodplain ordinance? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. I would like a motion on this, please, Council Cogsell. Madam Chairman, I move that we accept the um, update of the floodplain management ordinance. Same as presented. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Yes, ma May I just add a, a very large thank you to um, Mr. McGovern's secretary, Barbara Ray, for putting this on the computer for the word processor for the first time and doing all several revisions for us. It took a lot of time. That's a very tedious type of job. Yes, 30 yes. pages worth, so. She loved every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I enjoyed it, too. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> um, I would like um, consideration to take an item out of order, please. And I'm cons I would like it to be item number 136. If I could have a motion to that effect, please. So moved. We'll take that next. Second. Will the council? All those in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Item 136 is to consider the acceptance of a parcel of land from Alice Lorea located off Sawyer Road and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, I'm very pleased to announce that subject uh, to your acceptance, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth has been donated a 60-acre, plus or minus, uh, parcel of land on Sawyer Road. Uh, this, this land is on Sawyer Road as you're approaching from the South Portland End. Uh, on the left, uh, just before you get to the intersection of Pickett Street and Sawyer Road, or just before you get to the Young Farm. For those that are familiar with the Winnix House, uh, which is one of the oldest in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it's directly across the street from 
that home commonly known uh, as the Winnix home. Uh, this land is being donated uh, by Alice Larea of uh, Greenland, New Hampshire. Uh, Alice Larea is the daughter of uh, uh, Lou Winnick and the late Ruth Winnick. Uh, this particular land uh, uh, is, is being offered to the town conditional upon it being used for passive recreational activities. Uh, that would include walking, jogging, bird watching, nat nature observation, and that it be not allowed to be used for active recreational uses, organized sports, play fields, bike tournaments, track events, and that type of thing. In other words, it would be a natural wooded area uh, and passive recreation area for folks to enjoy uh, for generations to come. Uh, the deed provides that uh, activities and improvements that do occur uh, shall be of a character that would be harmonious with the natural beauty of the, proper, of the property environment. Uh, in addition to the deed itself, there is a proposed agreement uh, uh, with, uh, the, with Mrs. Larea uh, that provides for how the property will specifically be transferred uh, to the town. Uh, specifically, at this point in time, there would be a one-half interest uh, in the property with the town being a joint tenant. Uh, essentially, for tax purposes, uh, which we all understand, uh, over the next three years, uh, the balance of the, the donation uh, would take place, and uh, Mrs. Larea, as well as uh, uh, her husband, uh, have signed this, uh, providing that uh, you know not only the transfer takes place now, but the fractional interest uh, uh, will occur uh, over the next three years by March 1 of 1996, and that this is uh, binding upon the respective heirs, personal representatives, successors and assigns of the parties as well. Uh, that's that's a, a little bit of the legalese. But uh, this is, uh, without doubt, the largest single donation of land uh, that the town has ever received. Uh, the only other uh, parcel coming close to that, I believe, is Lions Field, which was donated by the Lions Club uh, back around 1970. Uh, so uh, Mrs. Larea is here this evening, along with her husband and uh, her father, uh, Lou Winnick, and, uh, very pleased to announce that uh, after some discussion over about a year or so uh, that we, we uh, are able to uh, uh, have the town council consider this acceptance this evening. Thank you very much. This is another one of those goosebump moments <laughs> for me as a town council. This is incredible. Would you like to address the council? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> we put the harmless one on the end. Don't we? I would like to hear a motion on this, please. I'd like to move uh, our acceptance uh, of this property uh, under the uh, conditions and terms uh, defined uh, like by the town manager. Thank you, gentlemen. Any discussion? Councilor Jordan. I, ha I have a couple of comments that take it back beyond the Linux. He was better known as Dr. Toby's. That's right. And uh, I just wanted to throw out that out that so people don't forget the old timers in Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> I have two little comments and I don't know as uh, you people really uh, realize that when you leave a piece of land for over years and years that there's got to be some, they should be in my opinion, but I'm not an expert in it, but I don't believe in trees falling down and possibly harvesting some the town will they be allowed to have some wood off it or logs off it if and when it deemed necessary as years go on. And I think that should be uh, a little note me and some thought be given because I hate to see it later here and get a bunch of blowdowns in there and I think that is devastating for what I call uh, <coughs> good land for forest products, I think they should be taken care of. The other thing is, uh, I believe the snowmobile is going to ride through there during the winter months, up and back there, somewhat, and as I read the, this, that's illegal. Is that correct? Who's going to place it? Hmm? Who's going to place it? My sense is it'll be placed to the extent that probably it's been placed over the years. <laughs> Uh, which is, you know, it's uh, during the winter, it's very difficult to get up back into the back end of the property. But uh, it is something uh, within the deed uh, that is not a permitted use. 
Okay, I just want to let you know I read it, and I agree with it 100%, but I don't see how it's going to be policed unless somebody complains that they're too close to their neighborhood and what have you. I, I would have loved to have walked the land over the last few months as we're having the discussion, but unfortunately it was about three feet deep in snow, and it's uh, obviously a beautiful parcel and uh, one that uh, will be uh, great for the town of the well, one other question to him, what is your feeling? You don't want no wood cutting or anything in the future. Is that correct? No, I don't think there's anything wrong with the guys carrying it. I mean, properly. I mean properly. I don't mean somebody going in there and slaughtering the place. If, if a tree is ready to be cut and matured, I feel they should be cut. Do we need that in writing? I think the intent is understood in the language um, improvements shall be of a character harmonious with the natural beauty of the property environment. And I think the discussion and the recorded part, the fact that this discussion is recorded, helps clarify the intent. That is a wide open statement in my opinion. Those few words there that let one people think. I just, I just get uptight about it because I hear about what's going on in Baxter State Park all the time and one person feels this should be done, which I agree should be done, and other people feel that that wasn't the intent of it. And I just felt I'd like to see it cleared up. Any further comments? I, 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 excuse Dollar. me, I, I just don't think that one should die there. Uh, and maybe it would be appropriate uh, for the town manager and the Lorayas just to have a letter of understanding or something of that nature which would uh, uh, spell it out so that there's something 50 years from now when uh, uh, even the town manager won't be town manager by then uh, we can reference. I think that's a very <laughs> wise solution to the situation and we'll ask the town manager to work with the Lorayas and Mr. Winnick to accomplish that if you're agreeable. Thank you very much. As I said, for me, this is not one of those goosebump moments. I will say for myself, and I'm sure I speak for the rest of the council and for the community, that we are very sincerely grateful to you and to your foresight and your concern for the town and its long-range open space plans. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly appreciate Thank you very it. Much. It's great. Incredible. Oh. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Jordan. I, I appreciate it as well as the rest, but I don't want you to feel that I was sitting there trying to throw wrinkles on the toes, but I was, <laughs> I was just trying to think of the future and what might happen down the road. And Councilor Jordan, we appreciate your attention to the detail and your concern for long-term consequences. Any further discussion? We do have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you, and thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. We'll go back to the regular order of the agenda. The next item. Did we? We did the flood plan. Get lost. Item number one twenty eight is to consider acknowledging receipt of the report of the service delivery options committee and take any necessary action. We did, the council did receive this report last month. We had a workshop on March 22nd with the Service Delivery Options Committee, went over the content of that report. What we need to do tonight is formally accept the report in town council meeting. And the manager has also provided us with some imp implementation strategies. Would you like to discuss those, Mr. McGovern? Would you like me to go into this could take a minute or it could take 10 minutes? I see votes for one minute. <laughs> I'm getting all sorts of looks in. Uh, I'd like to again, uh, on behalf of the staff, thank the Service Delivery Option Committee uh, uh, for the time they devoted uh, to the process and the, as well as for quite a few constructive suggestions. Uh, what this memorandum does in, in each instance is, is list uh, the recommendations of the committee and provide uh, uh, suggested implementation. In, in several cases, it does involve other groups. Uh, for example, the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Commission will be asked to look at a specific recommendation involving 
making the park an enterprise fund. Uh, the rescue unit will be asked to uh, provide a report back to the town council on the issue of uh, whether or not these ought to be charged for the rescue. Uh, we hope to work with the Cape Courier in uh, promoting uh, the use of volunteers in several areas. Uh, a number of areas have already been dealt with by the Finance Committee. Uh, and I'm working with the staff and Councilor Dalbeck on a pay classification study. They will also be looking at benefits. Uh, we're going to be looking a lot more at unit cost and uh, uh, particularly putting them on a three-year cycle where we're comparing all of our costs as well as uh, those uh, that are competitive in the private sector. Uh, we'll be looking at used equipment in, in every instance. Uh, uh, the staff believes we should uh, use wingmen, uh, wing people, uh, on our plows uh, when safety is consideration, which we believe it is in all plowing operations. Uh, we're going to be looking at street lights. We'll have a report on the agenda in June. Uh, we're going to be looking at wood chipping. And I think I've exceeded my minute, but uh, we're also uh, going to be working uh, uh, to implement the uh, better system of surveying citizen opinions uh, on different issues before the community. Well done. There's a lot to cover in a minute. I would like a motion, please. Madam Chairman, as, yes, uh, as chair of the uh, Appointments Committee, it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to uh, recommend to the Council that we do acknowledge receipt of the Service Delivery Options Committee uh, report that was originally given to Town Council uh, on March 12, 1993, as well as approve the uh, implementation strategy. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? Councilor Dahlbeck. One comment on one part of the implementation strategy. Uh, on the first page, under item number three, uh, where uh, it says, uh, I'll read all of item number three so uh, people will understand what this is about. Fort Williams will be established as an enterprise budget for fiscal year 1995. If, if it is not self-supporting, a contribution from the general fund, as it now reads, will be included in the budget regardless all costs for the park will be segregated. <coughs> the sentence which says will be included I would like will be considered. Okay. Yeah. You, you can't say something will be included in the budget a year before it happens. Really. Whatever. I don't want anybody to feel that there isn't a monkey on the back. Very good. Any responses to that specific point? Sounds good to me. Councilor Chapel, you're looking pensive. Oh, no. It doesn't bother me either way. Okay. Councilor Freeman? Yes, it's fine with me, and I just would <coughs> like to take the opportunity to again publicly thank the members of this committee. Uh, they include Stephen Bates, John Brady, uh, Gil Jordan, Gene Ginn Marvin, Richard Nest, and Michael Reardon, who chaired the committee. They did a really splendid job, and we thank them all publicly. Thank you. I have received some comments from citizens specifically specifically about the recommendations um, relating to Fort Williams. I appreciate Councilor Dahlbeck's um, wording proposal tonight, and I will support that. But I'm hearing citizens express very strong, very deep concern about the future of Fort Williams, and I think this is something that is going to be a major issue potentially in the upcoming year and need to reassure citizens that no specific recommendations are being made about how we're going to budget what kind of money we're, the town is going to budget for Fort Williams and we say it's going to will be established as an enterprise budget. That means we are going to look at other sources of revenue, however, for Fort Williams. It does not mean we are certain, it does not mean that we are going to necessarily charge entrance fees. That's why I've heard a lot of people say, if you tell me it's going to be an enterprise fund, then that means you're going to charge entrance fees. That will be considered, I'm sure, but that is not a done deal at this point. And I want to reassure people there will be good thought put into this. We are asking the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to look at other 
revenue options for Fort Williams. If you do have concerns, you may certainly be in touch with those commissioners and you can get their, um, the name of the chairman from Town Hall. There, and there will be a formal council decision on issues such as that. But I've had such strong concerns presented to me, I want to address them. <coughs> Thank you. The new chairman of that committee is Carolyn Smith. Okay, any further comments? Councilor Jordan. I just want to just say similar to what you have just pointed out because I heard the same issues there as far as and we feel of the information that they've got as of now that maybe there's going to be a chance to get into it. And I tell them that it's going to be reviewed and there'll be a lot of discussion on it before it ever comes to bear. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to take a hard look at how we do it and when we do it and what have you because I can remember some history of when that was purchased and now it's going to be wrong, but time goes on and things change, and I know that. We appreciate your historical perspective. <coughs> Any further comments? We do have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Item number 129 is to consider acknowledging receipt of the Finance Committee report on the fiscal year 90, 1994 general fund budget and take any necessary action. Right. Councillor Chapel. I request that you acknowledge re receipt of the report. Second. We need... We need Seven. Okay. We need to have the financial specifics read to be set to public hearing on May 10th. Okay. I request that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby acknowledge the receipt of the Finance Committee report and sets to public hearing on Monday, May 10th, 1993 at 7.30 p.m. Town Hall, the proposed fiscal year 1994 budget. Second. The financial number should be part of your motion, sir. Okay. So we'll go down. You want each item as we go? Item 129? Yes, please. No, the no, no, you're doing separate. I'll go right through I would like then. permission from the council to combine all of these items so that um, Councilor Chapel may read through just once. Is there any problem with that? We will vote on them separately, but he will read them just once. Thank you. Okay. Go for it. Item 129, the general fund budget with expenditures of $14,684,796 and revenues of $4,330,785 with $10,354,011 net to taxation. Item 130, sewer fund budget with expenditures of $1,507,000 and revenues of $1,507,000. 507890 Item 131, Riverside Cemetery Fund budget with expenditures of 11700 and revenues of 24195 Item 132, Spurring Church School Fund budget with expenditures of 4503 and revenues of 5400 And Item 133, Museum at Portland Headlight Fund budget with expenditures of 214167 and revenues of 234700 with a balance to reduce the project deficit. I recommend approval. Thank you. Can I have a second, second. to the motion? Second. Thank you. Okay, we need to have separate votes on all of these items. Item number 129, acknowledging receipt of the Finance Committee report and setting it to public hearing on May 10th. So moved. Second. All those in favor? I have a question. C Councilor Cogsell has a question, please. Um, I, in the past, Mr. McGovern, we've separately listed the town expenditures and the school expenditures. We're not doing it this way this time, just everything to the general fund. You do that when you adopt the budget. Uh, you have a whole series of motions. That we'll do that in July or June. 
At no, the end of May. May. The end of May. May. Okay. May I had that ready tonight, Councilor Cogshaw, if you want to put it in there. I'm all set. I was just asking because usually we do read them all separately. We will save that oratory for next month, I believe. We have a motion for item number 129. All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Item num number 130 is to consider acknowledging receipt of the Finance Committee report for the FY94 sewer fund budget. So moved. Second. Councilor Chapel. Is that just a leftover raising of your hand? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I had it. No, I'm going to keep it up until you get done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Roll it. <laughs> All those in favor of item number 130, <laughs> 6-0, thank you. <laughs> item number 131 is to consider acknowledging receipt of the Finance Committee report on the FY94 Riverside Cemetery Fund budget and take any necessary action. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? 6-0, thank you. Item number 132 is to consider acknowledging receipt of the Finance Committee report in the FY94 Spurwink Church Fund budget and take any necessary action. So moved. Second. All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Item number 133, to consider acknowledging receipt of the Finance Committee report on the FY94 Museum at Portland Headlight Fund budget and take any necessary action. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Item number 134 is to consider approving a series of recommendations from the Finance Committee to take any necessary action. Councilor Chapel? Yes, would you like me to read these uh, 10 recommendations that have come out of our deliberations together? Yes, sir, I would. I think All the right. public would appreciate that. Okay. We will request the Finance Committee that the Town Council approve the following uh, to go along with the fiscal year 1994 proposed budget. These are recommendations. One, total appropriations to departments are recommended as listed on Appendix A. Those give the changes, the ups and downs that we uh, put together during our deliberations. Number two, total net to taxation is as recommended in Appendix B, which is on the last page for you, which is the final one that we had on our final night. Three, the total recommended tax rate is $17.70 per thousand valuation, an increase of 58 cents, or 3.39 percent. Four, the town manager shall prepare a draft pay classification study to be submitted to the town council by June 1st, 1993. The study shall also review benefits. Five, the town manager shall prepare an updated inventory of all computer equipment by July 1, 1993, he shall seek volunteer professional advice to review how the town might better coordinate and update its computer system. Six, the town manager is requested to review the proposed adjustments in the street lighting account. The report shall be on the July 1993 town council agenda. Seven, the five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal years 1995 through 1999 shall include capital improvements for school and community services. Eight, a proposed bond for adhering to the requirements of the Americans for Disabilities Act shall be reviewed at the August 9th, 1993 Town Council meeting. Specific projects should first be reviewed by the ADA committee. Nine, the town manager shall prepare a draft policy for conference attendance by department heads for the June 14, 1993 Town Council meeting. 10. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission shall prioritize projects in the park master plan prior to funds being expended in FY 1994. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. It looks like we need to consider taking action on items 4 through 10 of these recommendations. Could I have a motion to that effect, please? So move. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or comment? Councilor Jordan? I'll go over here. I'm seeing your mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> I'll close it next time. <laughs> I, would just, I would just go to say that I understand why you uh, 
only went from four through ten. But what if the reports don't have to come in on four, five, and six until July, and maybe we might save a few bucks and come kind of back if you got some earth-shaking results. And this wouldn't be able to happen until next year. But that's too tight of a schedule, as I understand. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, that schedule is doable. In fact, some of these, my concern with some of these dates is we're, we're ready to move on next month. And, you know, I, I'm just a little hesitant, uh, you know, since this was drafted, uh, you know, if, if you wouldn't object to having some of them come in earlier. I would love it. <laughs> I think earlier would be fine. I, the manager seems to be comfortable with the proposed schedule or better. Well, early will be fine, but never later. Understood. Well, all I was saying, if they were earlier, then you might be able to adjust the budget. Mm -hmm. But if it's July, your budget's already adopted, so it's in effect this year. That's all I'm saying. If, I, if I'm correct, the budget has some assumptions related to some of these items. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Number four, five, six, eight, nine, and ten. Councilor Jordan. Well, I just want to direct one to the question to the manager about what is his feeling as far as uh, getting them in earlier than July. The items on the pay study, uh, June one is the earliest. We have a lot of reaching out to do on that one. Uh, I think the next one, July 1, is realistic. Uh, the one involving street lighting could be on next month's agenda. Uh, the ADA, I think, is, is ambitious, August 9th. That'll be difficult because there's uh, other folks involved. Uh, August, the one on uh, the 9th, I finished the draft today, uh, so there's no problem getting that on in May. And the Fort Williams, uh, that's kind of an open-ended. They just can't spend any money until uh, they submit the priority prioritization to you. So you're saying you can do number six and number nine for the May agenda? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would that be preferable, Council Jordan? I would like to see it, yes. I don't know about the rest, but that's my opinion. And five or six? Six and nine. It would be on the May agenda. Fine. That's doable. Okay. Very good. Any further comments? How was the motion draft? Could we amend? Ms. Lane, who made the motion? Councilor Chapel. Councilor Chapel? I did. You made the motion. Would yeah. you like to? We can either do an amendment or you can amend your original I motion. I certainly would. That's six, yeah. So move. You will amend it so that six, items number six and nine come to us in May. And the second was? Are you in agreement? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Six, zero. Thank you. Mr. McGovern, we appreciate your attention to those, speeding up the schedule. It's, you should thank the department heads as well for enabling it to be sped up. We have one in the audience. We thank you. <laughs> you can pass that on to your fellow department heads, please. Where are we? Item number 135. I'm sorry. No, that, that was, in my opinion, a motion and voted on the amendment. So now you're going to vote on the, whole, the rest of it on the off base. I voted for the amendment to change them two dates from July to May. Now you should vote on the rest of it. We had changed the original motion. I didn't hear that part of it. Okay, we'll go back and vote on the original. Yeah. 
what you can't go back. The intent was to change the original motion. All I heard him say change. I didn't hear him. If I had stuck with my first motion, you'd have to reverse yourself. But where I was willing to change and put those two things in there, and the second was willing to change, all you need is one vote. Yeah. Okay. Which is what we did. Thank you, Councilor Chapel. Item number 135 is to consider an appeal of a non-resident charge for the Spurwink Church from an individual who believes they should be charged the resident rate and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. On March 31st, a resident uh, uh, came in to rent the Spurwink Church uh, for their niece who, who lives outside of the community. Uh, it is the resident's feeling because uh, they actually live in town and are the actual renter uh, that they should be charged uh, the resident fee and uh, not the non-resident fee. Uh, the uh, person who's appealing this uh, has indicated that uh, that they would plan to give this as a wedding gift uh, to uh, to the bride and the groom uh, to, to pay for the church rental. Uh, a little bit of historical perspective on this. Uh, the town traditionally uh, has had uh, both a resident and a non-resident rate uh, the resident rate always applied to uh, the bride, the groom, and the bride, and if the bride's parents lived in the community. Uh, you know, under the, the old-fashioned traditional way of weddings, the, the uh, parents generally paid for the weddings. You know, that, well, that's not necessarily true anymore. It's, it's usually the bride or groom or, or the parents. Uh, back in July of 1991, uh, the town council considered a proposal uh, to prohibit non-residents from reserving the church altogether, uh, particularly out-of-state residents was uh, the specific proposal. Uh, it, at that point, it was defined uh, that uh, it'd be either the bride, groom, or a member of the immediate family, including parents, siblings, children, and grandparents, had to be a present or past resident of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, as it indicates here, this proposal was not warmly received uh, back at that point. But nonetheless, we have always uh, dealt with the church uh, that it had to be either the parents uh, or the bride or the groom had to be either current residents or past residents. Uh, and that has been the practice, and this individual felt, uh, as I'm repeating myself now, that since they were a resident and the renter, that they should get the resident fee. Uh, the concern of the, of the staff is that, you know, if anyone turned to and, you know, looked to anyone in town to actually rent the church for them, you know, regardless of whether it's an aunt or an uncle or, or a cousin or a friend, that it is a way to circumvent uh, the resident versus non-resident uh, fee. So uh, uh, staff would recommend that the appeal be denied. Thank you very much. So moved. Second. Whoa, what are we moving? Are we moving? That the appeal be denied. Uh, let's, is that let's, ha that's, let's have that state. I'd like a clear motion on this, um. please. Do you see where it is? Oh, yeah. We're considering an appeal. I need to have a motion to approve or deny the appeal. I move that we deny the appeal of a non-resident charge for the Spurwink Church. From I move that we continue um, the family connection as far as residential um, fees in the Spurwink Church. Is that, since you have listed what we consider to be familial connections. It would really help if you spelled that right into the record so that... Okay, that would be the bride or the groom, the parents or grandparents, present or past residents. Is that what you said there? That's yeah, that, that was never considered. That the grandparents is not... Yeah. What? Okay. That was the never... Practices. Grandparents <laughs> was never an op operable policy. Bride, groom, parents who are residents or former residents, did you say, would qualify for the resident fee for renting the Spurwink Church. The move is for a continuation of that policy. The motion is for a continuation of that policy. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? <coughs> Council is that Jordan. the way the policy reads now? No. The, the policy currently is, is unclear as to how resident is defined and how non-resident. However, it's, you know, I have simply stated the way that it's, it's always been practiced and no one has challenged it uh, to date until this point. So we're going to review the 
policy then to get this cleared up in the future? Well, I you don't think so? I think that was just accomplished to <coughs> approve her motion. Yeah, for this issue. It's Did she add in her motion, which I didn't hear, forever evermore? Nothing is forever and evermore. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're just voting. I'm just voting on this issue. We're voting on on how we define a resident to be eligible for the resident fee in the rental of the Spurwick Church. The Look, motion. My, under, my understanding on this motion, Madam Chairman, is that uh, we are doing two things. One, we are denying the appeal, this specific appeal. And two, we are really codifying an oral tradition that has been in practice, but now we're right. putting it clearly in black and white. So we're doing those two things by voting one way or another on the motion. That is my understanding. Now, when you put that in black and white, give it to me again, who uh, would be able to get uh, a permit? Ms. Grandparents? Lane? No. 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 no, they wouldn't. Let, let, let us have Ms. Lane read the motion back. First of all, you're denying the appeal. Secondly, you're defining who is eligible for the resident fee. It would include uh, the bride, the groom, the bride or groom's parents who are residents or former residents of Cape Lindsay. My feeling is if we get into other relative situations, we are opening up a potential conundrum that we don't want to get involved in. This has been past practice, so it's nothing. I just couldn't vote for it. Do you want to make any comments, Councilor? <clears throat> no, no. If you've got a policy and you want to keep it, why, well, I'll go along with it. But I couldn't vote for it. I'm a grandfather, and I figure if I've been here for 38 years, living here, and I've had three sons, two sons and a daughter graduates from Cape Elizabeth High School, I figure my family is pretty well Cape Elizabeth, and I, I feel it's a little bit going too far to tell me that I couldn't hire that church with a resident fee for somebody that I knew as long as it was a relative within the family. I don't go along with the friend part. But when you say that it's not allowable except to bride and groom and their parents, I just would have to vote against it. That's all. Would you like to propose an amendment that you could vote for? No, because I don't think it would fly. That's your prerogative. Any further discussion? <laughs> <clears throat> we do have a motion on the floor. Is there any if I may, Madam Chairman, I feel that the item on the agenda to the public tonight is whether you approve or deny this request. It isn't to change the policy of running the church, and that should be a separate item. It should be a policy should be written out so the public could see it and would have you and not railroad it in here. So I'm going to vote against it. Thank you. Councilor Dahlbeck. I would basically agree with Bill. I, I understand the need to codify the policy. I also understand the need to have it tight. And I don't want this issue to get in the way of what the long-term policy should or should not be. Somehow or other, we should be, we have a Spooling Church committee, I believe. We have a board of historic preservation. Of Fine. That, that basically handles that. But I think we ought to get that in a routine basis. I would be in favor of denying this particular appeal on the basis that we have not been allowing this type of situation to date. That's that appeal. And then going ahead and uh, doing something in writing for the whole, uh, uh, for the future. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll Council withdraw Council. My, um, my motion and have it that we deny this particular appeal this evening. I'll withdraw my second, I believe, and we'll leave the issue at the moment just to deny the appeal. Are you seconding that motion? Uh, I, I will give back the second on Thank that you. amended motion, yes. Councilor Coxell. I'm doing this with the direction that on next month's agenda we have definition of whom we consider to be residents. We do have a written policy already, and all good policy should have definitions, so if we could have that available next month. We have that clarification. 
Just, just it is the season. Just as an aside, I, I was reading the memo here, July 1, 91. The I first know. sentence is, perhaps my most unsuccessful <laughs> effort over the past few years has been where you're suggesting two amendments relating to use of the Sperling Church. <laughs> Those that have been on the council for a while know that I always strike out on this issue. <laughs> we'll give it a try next month. Yes, we will. <laughs> we have long discussions and don't seem to accomplish much either. Okay, we do have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Okay. Item number 137 is to consider a proposed policy for uses of the community center and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Ms. Wayne? In your packet, you did receive a draft policy for the community center. Um, what is in writing has been the ongoing practice that was defined at the beginning of the community center opening in November of 1991. Just very briefly, the community center would be available for Cape Elizabeth-based nonprofit groups and organizations. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The facility may not be used by private parties for such as weddings, shower, showers, and other social gatherings. Uh, it is also not um, for regular classroom use during the day except for community services programs. Uh, just as another definition, a non-based, a non-Cape Elizabeth-based group would be a group when the majority of the members reside outside the community. Uh, the capacity of the building is 49 persons in the building at one time, and the scheduling is, doing by, is done by myself at Town Hall. The hours are approximately 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. I would encourage you to approve this policy for use. Thank you very much. Could I have a motion, please? I move we accept the policy for the Cape Elizabeth Community Center as presented. I would second. Thank you. Comments? All those in favor? Councilor Jordan, you're no, go ahead. Go ahead. All those in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Probably was a foolish comment. Item number 138 to consider a proposed policy on holiday closings at the refuse disposal, disposal area. I can't talk tonight. And take any necessary action. Yes. Uh, Bob Malley, the director of public works, is approaching the microphone and uh, <laughs> <laughs> is here to explain this issue. Thank you. Uh, presently at the uh, refuse disposal area, we're closed on the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. And I would be uh, proposing tonight to expand those closings uh, to include um, the following holidays, New Year's Day, Memorial Day, and Labor Day. Uh, the reasons for this are uh, a couple. One, uh, especially on New Year's Day, we're finding a genuine lack of activity and use of the transfer station that day. Uh, one of our busiest days at the transfer station is usually the day after Christmas, where uh, a lot of the wrappings and what have you were deposited, and generally the weeks after that are very quiet. Um, Memorial Day and Labor Day, uh, as I pointed out in my memo, are what I would consider family-oriented holidays. And in lieu of closing for those days, I'm proposing opening up on the Tuesday afterwards to make sure that uh, we don't have a shutdown in three days. And generally, we do get a lot of calls from people on the Tuesday following those days wondering if we are open. And when we explain that we were open on the holiday, they're quite surprised. and uh, They're generally uh, anticipating us opening on that Tuesday. So I'm proposing opening on Tuesday from 8 to 5, the day after Memorial Day and Labor Day. Questions? Sounds good to me. Me too. Makes sense. I would move the recommendation. Second it. Any discussion? All those in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Good for morale, I believe. Okay. <laughs> Angel Steele, you have a one through. <laughs> Don't expect them all like that, Bob. Yes. <laughs> you do not use the C word. <laughs> Item number 139 is to consider approving the use of Fort Williams Park for a British car show and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, this would be the third annual event, I believe, that uh, is proposed to September 12th with a rain date of September 19th. It's a popular event, very little impact uh, 
on the community and it's just been well received in the past. Move acceptance. Second. Could you explain the food <coughs> vendor portion of this? Yeah, the, the, uh, when the Portland's Advisory Commission discussed this, they were a little unsure how to deal with the proposal for a food vendor and uh, referred it to the town manager to resolve. Uh, they plan to have a London double decker <coughs> bus uh, be served concessions uh, at the point uh, way up where, where the electricity is. Uh, different innovation. It's traditional when we uh, allow groups to use the port that they have uh, their own vendor and we don't get into choosing the vendors. Uh, we merely permit it and uh, hope that it's either one of two things. Uh, someone who's licensed by the state so we ensure that proper food handling techniques are used or two, uh, you, beyond that, you with the Lions Club. This particular group uh, preferred to have the uh, London double-decker bus and uh, as with the same thing and others, uh, uh, we usually defer to the desires of the group provided it's tasteful. They're proposing to have just one vendor. That's right. Is that right? I want to make sure I understood their language. Thank you. Are there any further comments or questions? All those in favor? 6 zero. Thank you. Item number 140 is to consider approving the use of Fort Williams <coughs> Park for a kite fly day sponsored by the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? This is probably the fifth uh, kite day. It's organized by a gentleman in Cape Elizabeth, again, has very little impact on the community and uh, the fort's a good place for flying kites and it has been approved by the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Sure, I think it's a great idea. A lot of fun. Right any other comments? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Item number 141 is to consider a recommendation from the Appointments Committee regarding a vacancy on the Arts Commission and take any necessary action. Councilor Creelman, who's chairman of our Appointments Committee. Yes, I'm delighted to propose this evening the name of Dana Tratner to join the Arts Commission. Um, Ms. Tratner is a uh, professional artist with a, a very, impress very impressive uh, CV attached with her application and uh, her participation in a, uh, in a variety of juried uh, shows, I think speaks for itself. Uh, she's both an artist and an educator and I think will uh, be an excellent addition to our Arts Commission. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? I uh, would formally propose her to join the Arts Commission. I'll second it. Any discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Item number 142 is to consider approving the warrant for the May municipal election and take any necessary action. Ms. Lane, do you have that? Yes, thank you. The warrant calls for the municipal election for town council and school board members on Tuesday, May 4th at the Cape Elizabeth High School Gymnasium. Polls open at 7 a.m. They close at 8 p.m. We may uh, begin processing absentee ballots after 2 p.m. on election day. The Board of Voter Registration will be in session on Thursday, April 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. here at Town Hall. We also accept voter registration during normal business hours, 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. And for those that are not available on Election Day, absentee ballots just came in the office today. So please come in and vote. Very good. <coughs> Can I have a motion, please? I would move the warrant. Thank you. I'll second. Any comment? All those in favor? <coughs> Six zero. Thank you. At this point on the agenda, we have finished with our scheduled items. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the council on any other item that is not on the agenda? I had just Seeing none. one announcement. Uh, Please. I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Portland newspapers have assigned a new newspaper reporter uh, to Cape Elizabeth. Dennis Hoey has been reassigned in the, the new reporters. Kim Stroh-Snyder, who is quietly Thank in the you. back row, and uh, she'll be, uh, has been permanently assigned uh, to cover whatever permanent is, uh, Kate Elizabeth and Scarborough. Uh, I'd like to welcome her to uh, cover Kate Elizabeth. Thank you for being here this evening. I would like a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Good. Good job, Jim. Thank you, sir. We're not in luck. I did not mention we had a two-minute meeting last <laughs> <laughs>